how do I get him to read? This was the question that I was most often asked when I was doing parent-teacher meetings as an English and literature teacher in secondary schools. My name is Maureen, and I would love to share with you some tips on how I got my students and now my own kids to read. My tip number one is that you should read yourself. Now, uh, the parents at the PTM, they ask me, how do I get my child to read? And then I will ask them, do you read? And then they'll be like, um, or they say, oh, there's no time. And, and now that I have my own baby and toddler, yeah, it is true, there's really no time. But um, what me and my husband do is we have books lying around the house. One day, uh, our daughter, she took one of these books and she started flipping through it. And after all, she looked up and she was like, so many words. And I said to her, oh yes, because it's a grown-up book. And a few days later, she, she was in the car, I was driving, and she took off one of the, the pads of her car seat. And she will usually do this, she'll take it out and she'll fold it up and she'll pass it to me. She said, mommy, mommy, here's some bread for you. And I'll take it and I'll go, nom, nom, nom. it makes her very happy, right? Um, this time, she, she didn't say it was bread. This time she said, mommy, mommy, I have a book for you. It's a grown-up book with many words, okay? And I, I was really so happy, so tickled. If your kids ask you, hey, what are you reading about? Then that's the perfect opportunity to, to, to tell them. And what's important is not so much the subject, uh, but it's about sharing that enthusiasm. You know, to really show them that reading is important to you and that's why reading should be important to them too. Another thing you can do is read aloud with your child. And for me, that's a really precious time. Before bed, I always read one or two books with my toddler. And she is at the stage where, she, you know, she wants to reread everything again and again and again and again. The end. Okay. <laughs> That, that is actually a problem because you, you want them to go to sleep, right? So uh, one book called Betty Goes Bananas in Her Pajamas was about a gorilla that, that does that. And I read that book with her and I asked her, is that right or wrong, what Betty did? And she was able to say, mm, it's wrong. So then subsequently, when she asked me to read her something again and again and again, then I'll remind her about Betty Goes Bananas in Her Pajamas. Stop, said Mr. Token. Bedtime is for sleeping. But it's a happy problem. If you don't have that tradition of reading aloud with your kid, it's never too late to start. And you may think it only works with young children, but no, when I had students who were like teenagers, 13, 14 years old, I would get the, the weakest ones in my English class to stay back after school for half an hour, some a few days a week. And all we would do is we would sit in a circle and we'd take turns reading aloud. And, and we won't use a school book or a serious book. I like Boy by Roald Dahl because those are like his memoirs of his childhood and he plays pranks. It's just very funny. I will take a turn and, and we'll do dramatic voices to kind of model expressiveness and grip pronunciation. And this was like supposed to help them in their preparation for oral exams. But really what I was doing was um, showing them that reading can be fun and, and also um, giving them that my, my valuable, my quality time and attention. And never underestimate how powerful that is to young people to have an adult show care and concern for them. Tip number two is to respect the reader. Um, and what I mean by this is don't, don't put down um, the child or whoever it is you are helping to read. You know, don't, um, don't use language that suggests that they're stupid or lazy. Don't attach any pressure to reading. Make it something for recreation. It shouldn't be something where they feel like, oh, they have to prove themselves. It's another test. You know, they, they associate it with school and it's like, oh, cannot. Many parents will ask me, is it important to, to get my child to read newspapers? Is it important to get my child to read things from the canon, like, like literature, you know, Shakespeare and Austen and all this? And I'll say, no, please, please don't do that. That will most likely turn your child off reading. Let them first build the positive associations with reading. Let them think that it's a joyful thing that they want to do, even if they have... You know, if, uh, if you had free time and you could choose to do anything in the world that you wanted, would reading be there in the top five things? 
No, for me, yes, it would. It might be like number one or number two. And you want them to have that same feeling as well, that they would choose to read. Books in, in the shops and the library are often classified by, by age. But realistically speaking, uh, you know, you could be, you could be my students. Um, many of them did not have English as their first language. It, they were like 15 years old. And actually their reading level was probably more like eight years old. And if you try and shame them about that, then, then they will never start anywhere, right? And why shame them? You know, it's a, reading is a skill and all students are on a ladder. And it doesn't matter how low the rung you start from. You know, everybody starts from the bottom of a ladder and climbs up, right? And it's not shameful that you start at the bottom and you climb up. What is shameful is if you don't climb. You know, they need to climb up on their own to master it. They cannot be parachuted in, you know, somewhere higher on the ladder. And then you expect them to climb up from there because they will just fall off. So let them start where they need to start and work their way up. How that looks like practically is that you need to choose texts for them that are at the appropriate reading level. A good rule of thumb is um, you read together with them. And then after that, you, you ask them questions to check how much of what they read they understood they should be understanding 98% of what they are reading. So for every 50 words, there is one new word that they have not seen before. Because that way, the new vocabulary can be acquired very painlessly. You know, they don't need to stop everything that they're doing and look into a dictionary. They can just figure out the meaning of the word from the context. Um, yeah, you, you want them to have that flow, you know, to get sucked into the story or get sucked into whatever they're reading and not have to stop. I, I had to move because my husband started having a work call. It was a bit noisy. But uh, you can see that I was not bluffing you. We really do have books everywhere. My my husband's side of the bed uh, has books on the bedside table. Um, and I wanted to share that if your child has a condition like dyslexia uh, that legitimately makes reading hard, you know, don't worry. It's, it's, that's not the end. Um, there are coping strategies. And you can look these up and try them out together with your child. Always be very encouraging. Tip number three is to keep it real and relevant. Okay, there's a theme that's like all R's, so it's easier to remember. Keeping it relevant to the kids' real lives. One way you can do that is to anticipate milestones in, in life, like um, getting a new sibling, like losing your teeth, or going to the dentist, going to school for the first time. Uh, and then find books about these uh, milestones and read them together with your child. And this will have a twofold advantage. First, it will help ease the transition. Sometimes things in life can be quite scary, like, you know, the onset of puberty and things like that. And, and reading about it actually helps ease some of those anxieties. And of course, it shows them that, that books are relevant to their real lives. Uh, another thing that books are great for is to create excitement before an outing and, or extend a learning experience. I took my daughter to an SSO concert for children and I knew that, you know, with COVID and all, there'll be a lot of waiting time in between doing the prevent test and, and this and the other. So I brought along a book with me called Usborne First Book of the Orchestra. And I read to her about the instruments and what she could expect to see. After the concert, I read the book to her again. And this time I pointed out some of the details that, that she saw in the concert, like how all the musicians were positioned in the same way that they were in the book. Even till today, weeks later, she's kind of still a bit obsessed with wanting to like pretend play the cello and pretend play the violin, especially before bedtime. I have no doubt that reading the book is, is part of what helped to capture her imagination and really make a lasting impression on her. It helps to be aware of children's interests and to guide them towards books on those topics. I once taught a class full of DSA athletes. So every single one of them was a sportsman. None of them would have probably considered themselves very academic or like avid readers, but I set them a composition on sports. And then suddenly, magically, so many of them were able to write very fluently because it's very clear that they had done a lot of reading on this particular topic of sports. A few wrote exciting commentaries on soccer matches, you know, because they've been reading all this, so they know all the associated vocabulary. The kids were writing from the heart. 
and from a world that they live and they breathe and they really know it, right? So if they're, um, if they're interested in a topic, then you don't have to force them to read and learn more about it, right? But then, um, so yeah, you don't need to be snobbish about what your kids read. If they're into comics, let them read comics. If they're into dinosaurs, let them read as many dinosaur encyclopedias as they want. Because just so long as they are reading, they are climbing that ladder. Right, and they're getting higher and higher and higher. And uh, inevitably, their interests will branch out. And if they've already got that skill and habit of reading, then they will read about their new interests. It, that, those things will just naturally flow. If you have a child who has already demonstrated an interest in some, uh, in some books, then capitalize on that. Take note of what are the writers they like, uh, who are the illustrators they like, and then introduce them to other books by the same people or other books in a similar vein. And it, it is, it's incredible to me that my two-year-old already has her own taste in books. One fine day, she just shocked me by, by holding up a Julia Donaldson book and then saying, is this by the same writer as Fox's Socks? I didn't tell her that, you know. Uh... Yeah, she figured it out on her own based on like the illustrations or the content or what. I mean, I don't know what's her thought process, but it just amazed me that that she could do it. So, um, yeah, once once they demonstrate a liking for something, then just keep on feeding them, feeding them more. Obviously, to start with, you would be supplying them with all these books, but when they're old enough, teach them how you go about finding a book in the library. You know, uh, teach them how the Dewey Decimal System works. Right, as the saying goes, teach a man to fish, and then you'll get them set on that road to lifelong learning through literature. Tip number four, the last R, is to do your research. Um, yeah, I mean, tip number one was developing your own reading habit. Tip number two is to uh, figure out your child's reading level and get books according to that. And then, and then uh, third, to keep things relevant to them. And of course, Doing all that, it doesn't happen by accident. You do actually have to do your homework. Um, when I was teaching English and Lit in schools, the, the basic professional expectation is to read a lot of books, uh, evaluate the books that you're reading based on the learning outcomes, the desired learning outcomes for your students, and then you finally you curate an eventual selection of books and then you plan learning activities based on the books. This is the standard that I set for myself now when I'm teaching my girls. But then, I mean, they're only like a baby and, and a toddler. Lah. And of course, you know, this kind of standard is, is uh, not realistic for a lot of parents. That's why there are schools and you send your kids off to be taught by professional teachers. Okay, I'm not saying that, you know, you need to invest this kind of crazy amount of effort. Uh, but you should invest some effort, right? If we take our kids' literacy seriously, then, then yeah, um, I think we should try to be quite intentional about the quality and the content of the writing that we expose our kids to. And um, I think the kind of mantra for myself, for, for this channel thing, is that I use my time so I don't waste theirs. You know, uh, everybody's time is precious. And... Each book represents an opportunity to either win them for reading, like hook them onto reading, or to repel them, you know. So, yeah, I grasp every opportunity and try and give them good books. And through this whole channel, I hope to give you good recommendations so that, you know, you, you save your time and you save your kids time too. That's all I have to share with you today. And just to recap, the four tips are read yourself, respect the reader, keep it real and relevant, and do your research. Um, I hope this has been helpful to you and that it will really uh, stir up uh, your, your latent book lover and get them to, to enjoy diving in to, to books. And if you like what you saw today, I hope you will subscribe. I will try and, and uh, put out more videos that will be helpful to parents, book reviews and other things. So do follow, subscribe, and uh, see you next time. Bye!